Thank you very much, I mean, for joining our research project in Central Park Making, which is led by Lena Jamil, Abby Fletcher, um, Stephen Lodge and myself. And we are uh, interviewing um, architects, craftspeople, and makers in Southeast Asia, uh, in, in the UK, in London. And we are very much interested in your approach to craft, um, also the way that you set up your practice, the way they work, they operate, the tools you use. And perhaps we could start off with your practice. Um, you're hosting us in a 15 Clerkenwell Road. It's a building we'll be discussing a bit more later on, but perhaps to start off with, I'm quite interested in how you set up your practice. Uh, I understand it's uh, a group work, I mean, to heart, so it's an employee trust. I was wondering what made you want to set it up in this way. It's group work, a group work employee ownership trust. Um, and what that means is the functioning company is owned by everybody who works there. We have a chairperson, directors, we have at monthly meetings at which everybody um, is involved in discussing everything from the cash flow, what projects are actually bringing in any uh, money, where the invoices are, to literally then the details of every, every design. Uh, and those are debated um, and concluded, as it were, to, to push projects forward. But essentially what it means uh, is um, ownership. I mean, we all know if you're working for a practice, you're either an employee or a salaried employee, and decisions are made elsewhere. It's not illegitimate, uh, but there is an advantage uh, to being more engaged with practice, and that's the decision we, we made. And can you uh, share with us a bit more about your journey from, I believe, uh, studying architecture in Edinburgh in Scotland, working for a number of um, different architecture practices uh, with Moth Architects, which is Davidson, to name just a few, and also working perhaps um, as an architect, also with engineers and bridges. So um, maybe if you just want to give us a bit of a sense of that journey. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's well. I'll, I'll try and keep it succinct. You graduate. You've spent years um, studying architecture. And it's mostly through drawing. Uh, very rarely any hands-on experience of materials at all. You maybe do uh, some technology lectures and uh, projects where you're actually beginning to suggest what details might look like, but you don't really understand them. They're still quite abstract. Um, and then eventually you join various practices and you imagine after so many years of study you're thrown into projects such as master plans which seems all very correct after so many years uh, but you're told on the first day that you'll be doing a dustbin of a master plan <laughs> which initially you might think oh, I've studied five years and uh, surely I'll be um, um, social engineering this new part of town <laughs> But you very quickly realize within a week, if not a, a day, you can barely design a dustbin, <laughs> let alone a, a, new, a new part of the city, because you've got no idea what the materials the dustbin should be made of, uh, or rather the structure that holds up a dustbin, uh, uh, economical way of putting a dustbin together. And very, you're humbled very quickly with um, contractors, uh, subcontractors, specialists, who make this stuff, who come in and you discuss how these things are best put together economically uh, and viably for the long term. So you realize you've got a lot to learn. And that's really the beginning of that journey where you, where, where you bring in uh, specialists as early in as possible to, to help, to effectively educate you. And at some point, apart from a one-way education it actually does become two-way because you might have some insights that they haven't come across before and between you there's a result that neither of you would have come to alone. So I'm actually quite interested in this rethinking and perhaps also challenging the traditional roles um, when Clerkenwell wrote you work with Pierre Pedro as Don Mason and um, can you describe it a bit how this kind of process of mutual learning or um, redefining roles has played out? Well, that's, that's, yes, exactly. That's a, the larger example of exactly um, what, what we've just discussed, where we were thinking of, uh, or we were challenged, is it possible to build this in stone? And traditionally, uh, or conventionally, I should say, uh, 
building of stone is a steel or concrete frame clad in stone veneer tiles and that seemed to us just intuitively it seemed slightly wrong after you know many years of working with buildings where the actual finishes are the structure themselves uh, but is it true is it uh, is it possible to build uh, with stone so it's actually the structure and the finish or are we cladding steel and concrete frames because that's the most economical and sensible way of putting things together nobody knew the 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 quantity surveyor didn't know the structure engineer didn't know the architects, um, us and, uh, and others, um, didn't know. So we asked uh, stonemason we were working with on um, uh, uh, staircases, stone staircases in traditional form where they're part reciprocal structure, part keyed into a wall. So they all understood, those masons all understood about structure, whether it's possible, and of course they said in France, we still teach it. It used to be called austerity construction. Of course it's possible. In England or the UK, you guys have lost three generations of that skill. That's why none of you know. So yes, uh, they educated us in, 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 in telling us it is possible. We then worked with them and structural engineers to decide on the scale of these stones to hold the building up, building regulations in terms of fire as well as progressive collapse. Uh, uh, gave them the quantity in terms of volume of stone. The quantity survey realised, goodness, it's actually cheaper to do it like that than the received wisdom, the convention that we've been working with for the past, whatever it is, um, since, since early 20th century. And I believe also alongside the economic cost, there is a consideration of carbon footprint, and mm -hmm. if I'm not wrong, yeah. the carbon footprint is only yeah. about 10% uh, of the comparable concrete structure, even though the limestone had to be imported from France, I believe. Precisely. Yeah. Um, so can you perhaps Given also that you are um, perhaps developing, mm -hmm. I think with Basalt in this case, mm -hmm. in Finchley Road, yeah. this technique that isn't really very common. I think mm -hmm. there is some mm -hmm. yeah. examples in southern France and uh, also historically yeah. with Fernand Poyot. Um, but can you describe a little bit how mm -hmm. that actually works and yeah. how the both, I think, the tectonic and the yeah. economic and environmental yeah, so architecture in general should, should seek to satisfy a number of purposes. So it's not just the structure and the aesthetics, but certainly uh, and the sustainability, it's environmental performance and so on. Uh, it's economic uh, performance. Uh, all of those have to, have, to, have to be managed, as it were, and that's the role of the architect as team leader. We have, again, an intuitive feeling that the embodied calm is bound to be lower if we're not using that amount of steel or concrete. Mm -hmm. We thought it might be 15%, 20% lower, 25% possibly. And at the end of it, our sustainability engineer and, and uh, mechanical electrical engineer, after the building had been modeled, and then when it was actually complete and we did a survey, uh, they phoned us up and, and told us there was a 92% a saving of the embodied carbon had we built it in steel and then clad it in, 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 in stone. Uh, and we asked, why? Well, goodness, how on earth did we do that? Uh, I won't tell you, just think about it and, uh, and call me back when you've realised how it's done. Uh, so we all scratched our heads, spent 24 hours or more thinking about it, and then somebody realised, of course, the, the, the stone has no embodied carbon, it's just sitting in the quarry. And the only embodied carbon that's, or the, 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 where, where the carbon's coming from is the energy that's burned in cutting the stone, transporting and erecting on site. Uh, and, uh, and we phoned him back up and he said, absolutely, and he said, had the British quarry been able to provide it, he would have saved another 5%. Uh, because, he, as you say, we had to truck it from France. Now, in the overall scheme of things, 5% isn't a, a great loss, but uh, um, even in France they've realised they're actually burning energy in the cutting and transportation, and the central government has suggested, and some quarries are already doing it, that the cutting and transportation is done with electrical tools using renewable energy to bring the, the embodied carbon even further down. Now, that's just using stone because the stone itself has no embodied carbon, it's the cutting and transportation. After we, uh, we finished it, we'd, um, we'd actually finished two other projects in cross laminated timber and, and others using more timber still where there was nothing else apart from cross-laminated timber and even internal petitions, all in, 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 in timber. No plasterboard, 
no um, aluminium stud work and all the rest of it. Uh, and our sustainability engineer looked at that and said, actually, the amount of timber you've used, because it's still, despite the fact it's come from Germany, uh, it's sequestered so much carbon, the superstructure, the structure, the finished product itself, the building, is carbon negative. Obviously, we've got more to do in terms of the amount of energy that's used in making the building, the structure and construction on site, the amount of energy that's used uh, um, in its life lifespan, and then obviously what happens to that material at the end of it. Uh, so we're working with students at the moment, demonstrating that that idea can be taken further. So on low-rise buildings, yes, it can be mostly timber because you don't really need to use anything particularly heavy. Uh, and but the taller you get, and for fire reasons, you'll start using stone. Combine those and you'll still end up with structures that are carbon negative. To satisfy the, the life cycle as carbon negative, one, you have to demonstrate the, the energy use still remains quite low. Uh, and then at the end of the life cycle, what happens to those materials? Now, timber currently, it was the Institute of Chartered Surveyors and the Institute of um, Engineers uh, assume, say, we, because we don't know, we must assume that timber uh, on demolition is taken away to landfill, is allowed to degrade, decompose, and in that process produce carbon dioxide. If it's, uh, or it's put into um, um, incinerators for fuel and, uh, and also produces carbon dioxide, or it's uh, pulped, stripped apart, pulled apart, pulped, and turned into another product. In other words, taking more energy, again, increasing its embodied carbon. Uh, to, to become positive again. So at the moment, some research suggests that even things like cross laminated timber have a, a larger body carbon than, um, than, than a piece of steel, mm. because the steel can be reused. Mm. Which of course, if no one's looking after mm. what happens to that material at the end of it, might be correct, but it seems to us absurd. So there are people out there, and I think in, in Amsterdam already, the, the, the um, local government suggesting that we material passport mm. uh, 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 buildings as they're built. Uh, we, we identify those materials, and then should they come up for demolition, anybody who's considering building already knows these materials are at hand. So we're adopting that methodology to identify those materials for future reuse. So the, piece of CLT that's 14 meters long and two meters wide is not taken off and pulped or burnt, but actually reused is perfectly possible in the same way as a piece of steel being reused is perfectly possible. And in doing so, you then maintain the idea that this whole building from beginning to end is still remains as carbon negative. Uh, we're working with um, some people at ETH Zurich uh, where, like us, they say we need to change the narrative. You can build to, to lower carbon. So the um, hypothesis of this thought experiment really is, if you're making buildings out of timber, uh, they are carbon um, negative uh, um, uh, because they're carbon sequestrating. Uh, if you maintain that across the lifespan, essentially you've created a, a carbon sequestrating industry. So I think coming back now perhaps to stone because that's a material yeah. that is much less widely used and perhaps yeah. quite striking that in the five years since completion of 15 kilogram per row, I haven't really seen um, stone being used as an exoskeleton. I think mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. doing a new project now in Finchley Road in yeah. Hampstead. So why do you think um, is there this reluctance in using uh, stone? It's been used by in, in uh, mm. France, it's been used historically by Fernand Poyot after the yeah. Second World War. Yeah. But in contemporary architecture, I would perhaps yeah. even say that your buildings are the mm. only uh, instance of this use which seems very logical. Yeah. Uh, just, it's not ubiquitous. So if, if uh, we've, we've lost skills, we've lost uh, as a common material, apart from thinking of it as cladding or ornamentation. Um, that's really the only reason. Once, uh, once it becomes more common, um, um, <laughs> like anything else, but yes, it's unusual now because the convention is steel and concrete frames. We just, especially in this country, have de-skilled 
But even in France, where they have the skulls, steel and concrete are the common convention. They are the, they are the, they are the method, as it is around, around, around the entire world. Now, interestingly enough, there are uh, communities where they can't even afford the steel or concrete, so they're still making things out of stone, but they tend to be more informal buildings, houses that are not um, part of formal development. And really, that's all we're asking, people to return to that. Think of stone just as yet another material, no different than the, the brick or the concrete or steel you might pull off the shelf for your menu of, of building materials, except it happens to be lone in body units and body carbon. Not think of it as some sort of special decorative material. As to that note of um, decoration surface and building process, you've um, spoken about the continuity of craft knowledge, mm. perhaps also about the continuity of history, and I think that brings us to the controversy that's around the 15 kilometer Rose, where you actually argued, I believe, um, that. The Normans used limestone, they yeah. uh, corrected yeah. and worked it when it was wet. Yeah. You described actually the practices of uh, crafting stone as something that you are linking to that uh, kind of yeah, thread that you're picking uh, up again, yeah. Yeah. which is in kind of stark opposition to the way um, that the historic preservation district mm -hmm. would emphasize the appearance of things. And first, can you talk a bit about that? which I think they find a very interesting understanding of tradition that is less about appearance and much more about the continuity of processes and, yeah, and yeah, craft. Yeah, 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 I mean, um, where do we start with that? Um, oh, well, we're interested in, uh, fundamentally we're interested in our DNA, as it were, as a practice, we're interested in, uh, in um, uh, tectonics. So what um, uh, Bertica, Gottfried Semper and others would have called the the joining, binding, and completing of architecture. So this is uh, um, 19th century, um, early 19th century, even from Schinkel, when he's having his moment of crisis. Uh, he's, he's become the master of the neoclassical, but he's having a moment of crisis after he's come to, to England, Scotland, and Wales, and realized the Industrial Revolution. So this is obviously the late um, uh, 18th century, and then going into the 19th century realizing all this construction is happening without a neoclassical vocabulary and language. It's just happening. It's being built out of brick and stone and cast iron and wrought iron and timber all joined together. And some of it a bit more formally, uh, whether they're factories, warehouses, uh, infrastructure such as bridges and viaducts. And as a result of that, we have Vertica and Semper and others uh, uh, saying the etymology, the origins of all architecture is, is, is based on how things, materials, are, are brought together. And that's not just architecture, it's what Semper calls the applied art. So he initially applies it to a chair, a stool, uh, and says how those pieces of wood are joined together, they're bound together then with rope, and then the, the rope eventually has a particular pattern, and that, that becomes the ornamentation of the completion. At that point, there's a, it's emblematic of a culture. So specifically for the Assyrian stool, the king's, um, the king's um, stool, which then the ornamentation becomes door surrounds or the frieze to, to, to a palace or city walls. That then, uh, I don't want to say, um, uh, gives crisis to, to a whole generation of architects, but makes them think again, which is why, while they're looking, because it's, as far as they're concerned, this is the modern age now, so this is the 18th and 19th century, it's the modern period, what is the architecture of the modern period? Uh, enlightenment, in industrialization, can it be the architecture of the Greeks, apparently, and they decide not. And while they're grasping, they decide on the, um, decide on the Gothic revival, as it were, the revived Gothic was at least it's tectonically honest in, in their opinion, and of course it's conflated with politics in terms of Christianity. Um, so we're interested in, in, in that as our DNA, as it were. Uh, and what really that's telling you is process as opposed to product, uh, which is really, uh, which is nothing new. Uh, I mean, certainly in other, other industries, uh, certainly in art, it's, it's very common. But even in architecture, you, and it, you have to go back as far as Vasari in the um, 16th century, and you can see he's already arguing that process is far more important than product. And process is actually uh, 
autobiographical. It's to the person, to the craftsman. Mm -hmm. So it is the, the apprentice who becomes the master, who's mastered their craft. Uh, 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 and it's the innovation by those craftsmen that gives them a manner, a personal manner. And it's based on the knowledge they've built up in handling those materials and bringing them together. Same thing as Semper and others are discussing. That's essentially what we're interested in. Yeah, and all we're saying is that wherever you go, you, you should be applying that. Nevertheless, you could come up with the same solution. If it's just tectonically driven in terms of materials coming together, it might not have any poetic relevance or, or, or resonance in, in a particular context. You might decide it, it shouldn't. But perhaps for the sake of keeping your, 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 um, your interest, you know, being selfish about it, you search, you research into that context, and maybe there is something that uh, uh, um, diverts from a standard pragmatic solution to something a bit more poetic, brings those materials together in a different way. So this uh, notion of the poetic of construction, which to some point, as you have pointed out, was equally important, and the idea that uh, joinery is emblematic of a culture, the idea that um, uh, knowledge is passed from one generation to the other, but also exchange between cultures. And also, finally, what you mentioned about the autobiographical yeah. um, narrative of craft and craftspeople. Yeah. Um, you quoted um, German architects of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. I believe that you were born in Germany. That's and correct, yeah. Your parents are from Iraq and Sudan. Mm -hmm. um, you're working with a French stonemason. Mm -hmm. So there is a kind of theme of cultural exchange. I was just wondering whether you've ever um, kind of reflected on that or whether that's a particular mm. Mm. Um, uh, interest that sets you apart from other architects or how would you, would you describe uh, it? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's difficult to uh, speak for other architects. <laughs> but, um, uh, I mean, if you reflect on it, you certainly, inevitably, you have to reflect on it. You don't, you don't get given much of a choice. You're forced to reflect on it if you're an other, as it were, in a, in a in an otherwise uh, homogeneous community. Um, so that's how you tend to reflect on it. That's you, you are conscious, you're aware of it. Uh, uh, but that's, that's, um, you're, you're open, as it were, to, to influences. Uh, don't have difficulty with being open to them. We have found in doing this project that initially we were quite nervous about the idea of UK, Malaysia, this kind of almost diplomatic yeah, yeah, exchange, yeah, and then yeah. actually all of the um, architects and craftspeople we've interviewed so far have had roots outside the UK. Mm. But I was just wondering about this sense that I'm also, as you can hear, mm -hmm. not born in the UK, yeah. but I'm wondering about this sense of being an outsider or mm. Mm. Um, kind of having another perspective. Yeah. I mean, I'm uh, in terms of architecture, philosophically, life in general. It means I, I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure if that's entirely as a result of, um, of, uh, of that sort of background or whether that's just entirely personal. Because if I think of my brothers and sisters as four of us, some of us will adopt 100%, if I dare I say, I'm sure they might argue. Uh, uh, context, while well, I tend to be a bit more contrarian, mm. and I think, uh, well, probably two of us are a bit more contrarian, and two of us are, mm, don't mind following convention, and uh, that's probably just personality more than it might be, might become more acute of being um, made conscious that you're an outsider, as it were. <laughs> but is being a contrarian a kind of driving force, is a productive force? I think you've been very bold, definitely, in the way that you handled. Pros yeah, that exactly, precisely. Of course, you're, I mean you're 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 on the right track. Uh, inevitably, um, um, you can you question convention. Yeah, always have to um, uh, deliberately <laughs> for, for the purpose of being um, um, opposed. You don't have to do that, but if you find there's a there's a there's a better alternative you argue it. Mm -hmm. And obviously sometimes it gets you into a bit of um, hot water mm. because some people like convention. They don't want to question it. Mm. You don't quite realise um, how much they like it and they don't want it changed until they, um, until they battle with you. Yeah.
think it would be very good for the benefit of viewers who are not familiar with the, I think, the whole thinking process that underpinned the stone exoskeleton and also the way that you're using concrete, you're using the stone exoskeleton, the way you're assembling those materials and perhaps just a description of how that works would be fantastic. Yeah. So the exoskeleton is, is, is what it sounds like. Um, it's uh, the superstructure on the outside. Uh, it's post and lintel trabeated structure. So a column and beam coming together. Most of us will, be uh, uh, will know Stonehenge. So that's just column and, and beam sitting on top. It's a series of Stonehenges, one on top of the other. Couldn't be simpler. Now, if you're not in a seismic zone, uh, which most, most of the world isn't, Column and beam, static, is fine. You don't need to brace it or create any other links. Gravity, just these two-ton, three-ton pieces of stone sitting on top of one another will keep themselves uh, uh, in place, even under wind um, loading and so on. Uh, behind each of um, w where column and beam come together, there is a, a metal boss. It's a small area of metal that's grouted in, so it's only grout. Uh, and then there's a male and female fixing, one grouted into the, um, into the stone, the other one already cast into the slab. And since building this one, we've realized actually we could have made these slabs of cross laminate timber. So instead of grouting the other fixing in, you'd create a ring beam onto which the CLT drops. Between them, you place a, a nylon bar, and that nylon bar uh, might be you know, 300 by 300. Uh, by 30 mil thick, but then creates the thermal break. And then on that line comes a curtain wall. In this case here, it's about 30% timber. The rest of it glazed. Uh, and that's your superstructure and external envelope that gives you a column-free internal space. Superstructure is, is then external finish at the same time. Uh, yes, that's lowered the embodied carbon, it's lowered the cost, it's lowered the amount of materials on site but it also gives you a column-free interior. And what that means is what the 1970s, I think, uh, termed loose fit. Mm -hmm. So it means internally, you can subdivide it how you wish today. Tomorrow you can remove all that without affecting the structure, subdivide it another way or leave it open. So it can be a residential office, hotel, public building, uh, whatever it is, without then creating, uh, having to demolish or rebuild or or any major structural um, intervention. At the roof uh, is what's called a blue and green roof. So every building in the UK now has to have water attenuation. So none of the rainwater is allowed to go into the sewage system so you don't flood the sewage system. Uh, so you have to keep the water on site somewhere and then create a pump, an infrastructure in the building that pumps a different parts of the building. And it occurred to us, why don't we just keep the water on the roof? no infrastructure, just one large collector as it were. Uh, and then the green roof can use that. Um, the two don't normally, you know, don't overlap. It's possible, but whatever vegetation you put up there has to be able to drink it all. It's quite a lot of water. Uh, now large trees can do that. Grasses on their own and shrubs can't. So consequently there's uh, four trees and a lot of shrubs and other plants to be able to take all that water, the, the annual rainfall. And what we found is actually it thrives incredibly well. We're very, very surprised how well it's done. And that's what we're now uh, promoting on, on, on all buildings. Mm. You suddenly get a little biodiversity up there, more than you'd ever expected in, in standard wild grasses. Mm. So there's, you name it, in terms of birds and invertebrate insects and beehives and snails and slugs and God knows what up there. Um, uh, compared to what we expected. Uh, how are you developing this system in Finchley Road? I believe that you're using basalt for fire or resistance. Yes, reasons. so every stone has got different properties. At uh, Finchley Road, the building's twice as high, so it has to have a different fire performance, which basically means the stone, the limestone, would have to be about twice the size. Uh, and then uh, when we were talking to our stone mason, he said, well, have you thought of basalt? Mm born from the volcano. And we tested both the limestone and basalt under fire conditions and under three separate um, material junction conditions. So as an exoskeleton, mm -hmm. 
as an engaged um, column on a corner, as an engaged column in its facade, as it were, and found that uh, under the, uh, both stone types and under those three conditions, as an excess skeleton, it works best because the fires are allowed to go all the way around and, and uh, heat the stone all around, so it doesn't create internal um, 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 differentiation of, um, of expansion and splitting the, split the stone um, prematurely. And then, of course, we also found out the basalt performs best and can be half the size. So that means half the amount of cutting, half the amount of transportation, half the time on site in terms of erecting it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks.